Hello everyone, I'm Scott Christensen and this is a special presentation for the 2020 Naval History Conference, a joint event from the United States Naval Institute and the United States Naval Academy. Deception of warfare goes back to early history, but in the 19th and 20th century it became more sophisticated as magicians such as George Malays began to apply the methods from stage magic to the new medium of motion pictures, thereby pioneering special effects. As the movie industry grew and technology improved, these effects became more convincing. By World War II, these deceptions that had been used to entertain audiences were being used on a larger scale to defeat the enemy. Hollywood special effects artists and magicians worked to make military installations and factories seemingly vanish overnight, while also conjuring up phantom fleets and special squadrons that confused the enemy about the size and location of Allied forces. The high stakes of the Cold War resulted in the intelligence community further developing their methods of deception and counterdeception. This intersection between magic, special effects, military and intelligence is fascinating. And for you, we have two of the foremost experts on the topic. The first is the greatest magician of our time, a collector and avid student of magic history, David Copperfield. And who better to talk about espionage in the world of intelligence than a former spy master? Also joining us is the former acting director of the CIA, John McLaughlin. David and John, please share with us some secrets. Thank you, Scott, and welcome midshipmen and others attending this event. Uh, today, we're going to be talking to you about magic, war, and intelligence. Uh, I'm John McLaughlin, the former acting director of the CIA, and deputy director. Uh, today, I'm a professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. And I've been a magician since I was a little kid, which means I'm very honored to be here today with a person that everyone acknowledges universally to be the world's greatest magician. David Copperfield. So kind, thank you so, so much. And thank you, Midshipmen, all the fantastic people out there for, for joining us today. Magic is an amazing uh, way of thinking. Um, magicians have to uh, uh, have many plan Bs and plan Cs. They have to look at the world in a different way, uh, as everyone does, you know. Uh, uh, we're here in my museum, which is filled with amazing history of magic, uh, which we'll be discussing today and how it relates to what you're interested in. Um, magic uh, uh, has afforded me the ability to think in a way that's uh, maybe different than you'd normally think. Uh, I guess you can liken it to a, a climber who walks into a room and they see, you know, they see the room in a different way. They see, well, I can put my foot there, my foot there, and they can go uh, to achieve the, the heights they need to do as a climber. As a magician, you look at opportunities uh, to make magic out of those things. You look at design functions, you look at uh, how people interact with each other, their communication skills, you look at things to misdirect and things to, uh, uh, to design and, and create in a different way. And that's been very useful in, uh, in this world uh, that you're in. And John's gonna kind of take us into that world right now. John? So as we talk to you about these things, I wanna mention that we're gonna cover a number of things. We're gonna talk about some specific tricks that were done in the course of history. We're going to talk about some techniques that magicians have used and brought into the world of war and the world of intelligence. And we're also going to talk about some very unique people who were involved in all of this. Uh, among those we're going to talk about uh, is a gentleman, a Frenchman, who is uh, very famous in the 19th century and someone to whom uh, magicians today still look uh, for a lot of inspiration and a lot of the history of this art and who played an important role in history. And David, I think, has uh, a special insight into this individual by virtue of some of the things in his museum. David? This is a room that honors a man named Robert Houdin. Robert Houdin, we think of as the father of modern magic. Uh, back in the uh, mid 1800s, he uh, created and invented many things, new technologies like these mystery clocks that tell time, uh, even though the, the handle is attached to a piece of glass. You can look it up, Google it. Mystery clocks do amazing things. Uh, he uh, took magic off the streets, uh, off of these performers who would have like conical hats and do kind of wizardy things and made it uh, kind of a common, common dress and common, uh, uh, he dressed like the common man, let's put it that way. Um, and he did something very, very special uh, with a box very similar to this, called the light and heavy chest. Uh, it's uh, an amazing story and John can fill you in. Great, thank you, David. 
Well, here's the story. Uh, it's 1856, and we're talking about Algeria. Now, France had begun colonizing Algeria in 1830, and it was a difficult uh, job for the French and for the Algerians. And about 1856, it turns out there were some people in Algeria, influential leaders of one of the sects there, the uh, Marabouts, who were not completely in line with French policy. And the French government, according to this story, and, and there's much that we don't know about it, but we think the, the essentials are correct. The French government asked Robert Houdin, famous magician, to come out of retirement and do a performance in Algeria. In order to impress the Algerians with some of the miracles that France commanded. And Robert Houdin went there and he did his usual performance, a brilliant performance as a magician. But that light and heavy chest that David just showed you played an important role in it in the following way. Uh, he first had a, an Algerian boy pick the chest up, which he did with no trouble. And then he asked one of these chieftains, Algerian chieftains, to pick it up. And that person could not do so because Robert Houdin claimed that he was able to take away his strength, that this was the power of France. He couldn't pick it up. Well, it, it turns out that he was using electromagnetism, which at that time was not well known outside of a tight uh, scientific community. And uh, so he was using technology basically to, to perform a magic trick, which is, uh, not uncommon, technology and magic have gone forward through history together. And uh, apparently this convinced people in Algeria that indeed France possessed powers that uh, were not available locally and in, in enhanced France's uh, power there. Uh, now I'm gonna move along here to uh, World War II and talk about this gentleman, uh, not a household word, but in the world of intelligence and deception, he is. This is Brigadier General Dudley Clark, a British uh, officer. And the first thing I wanna tell you about Dudley Clark that connects him to our presentation is that he was the nephew of one of the great uh, well-known magicians of Great Britain around 1910, 1920, that era. This was Sidney W. Clark who headed an organization called the Magic Circle, one of the most prestigious and earliest magic societies in the world. So Dudley here was his, his, his nephew and learned card tricks and such as a boy. Now, I can't prove to you that that's how he did his deception in war, but I strongly believe that thinking like a magician, the point David made right at the beginning of this presentation, was one of the things that helped him be such a great master of deception. Uh, he became head of a group called A-Force, A-Force, which was the major British deception unit in World War II. And he was active in the Middle East, he was active in North Africa, uh, and he also had a hand in Operation Bodyguard, which was the deception operation put into practice before the invasion of Normandy in 1944. And not surprisingly, given his history, he had at least one magician working with him whose name was Jasper Maskelin, a well-known British uh, magician. And I think David is gonna say a few words about uh, Maskelin. Well, Maskelin came from a long dynasty of, uh, of great magicians. Uh, the Egyptian Hall, uh, Maskelin, Devant, Maskelin and Cook, uh, many, uh, creations of magic were done by the masculine family. Uh, it created a lot of pressure, I think, for Jasper to kind of live up to the family name and reputation. And he did so in many ways uh, with his work in World War II. Um, as many magicians do, they uh, make things grander than perhaps the truth is. Uh, there's two sides of it. One is invention and creation. He did invent some things which John will tell you about which are real and really wonderful. Of course, the publicity of it all was that he made things disappear, ports disappear and, and forts disappear and so forth. That's a little bit questionable, but the, without a doubt, he did create some things in his, uh, to help his family legacy in, in World War II, which uh, I think they should be very proud of. 
Yeah, as, as David indicated, uh, Maskelyne's role uh, was embellished by himself and others, uh, but scholars have looked into what he was doing and determined that indeed he did have a serious role and that he was uh, particularly effective in the development of camouflage. Um, he also uh, invented some tools that were useful for British and allied officers in escape and evasion circumstances. And let me just tell you a little bit about his camouflage work. Uh, the main thing that we give him credit for in the scholarship on this is the creation of something called a sun shield. Uh, the sun shield was an escape, uh, an invasion technique and also a camouflage technique. Basically by folding this device over a tank, the tank could be made to appear from the air and from certain other angles as a truck, an innocent truck. He also put together a little device that erased in the sand, this was in North Africa, erased in the sand the treads that any tank are certain to leave behind and gave the impression that what was rolling under this, uh, under this camouflage cover was, was actually a truck. Now he made tools for uh, escape and evasion. He was known for this, uh, things like um, a button that would have a compass hidden in it, a uniform button. Um, edible paper, you could have a message on a piece of paper and, and eat it. Don't know whether it tasted very good or not. Uh, he had hacksaws that were built into zippers and maps made of something called flash paper, which is a fairly common magic item, of course. He used all of these things as part of his, uh, his toolkit. And then Clark, Dudley Clark, the uh, head of A-Force, was also active at the time of the invasion of Normandy in 1944. And uh, this was under Operation Bodyguard. On the left of this slide, you will see the actual bodyguard order with all of the notations from allied officers on it. And the most famous uh, example of this period was the inflatable tank, a rubber tank that could be lifted by uh, men as you see here. Uh, and enough of these along with other kinds of similar deceptions, weaponry, artillery and such that was false could be used to create a kind of ghost army in a place um, that you wanted the Germans to look rather than where you were actually massing forces for the invasion. Now, during this period of time, Maskelyne was focused on escape and evasion training, and he was actually given a good deal of credit, including by American forces for the lectures he would give uh, to prepare people for what they would have to do if they were uh, captured. And he also invented some tools that were useful for, um, uh, for resistance forces in various, various places. So this uh, is a resistance force uh, device, which is uh, these boxes, these, I mean, this is not masculine, this is a whole separate thing. I'm not sure who's credited with this. These are uh, wax covered boxes that we would hold a very cheaply made gun. They'd be thrown out of airplanes for resistance fighters to help them on the ground. Included in that box was instructions. This is actual, looks like contemporary drawings, but actually it's, it's from back then. This is the actual pa paper. It would show one, two, three, all step by step how to use that gun to help people who were trying to help the, uh, the good guys in this case. So um, that's an actual thing that would be used in that way. Uh, I love uh, misdirection, you know, magic uh, misdirection. And it's simply put is having something really great to look at over here and hiding something over here that you wanna hide by having something very interesting over here. Another form of misdirection, again, this is not masculine, but very, very cool, are these heads, um, which are doll heads that were commissioned by the government from from toy companies you know everybody in world war ii uh, had to make their products for the war effort in large part and even toy factories were making these uh heads of paratrooping soldiers these are quarter-sized men total body quarter-sized uh, men in paratroop uniform that would be thrown out of airplanes to have the germans see them because of scale. You couldn't tell the scale, they're up in the sky. A quarter-sized person looks like a full-sized person. 
coming down and they'd of course go chasing what, what's happening there, allowing us to come over here and do our magic at the time. So I, I, I love the fact that that kind of magic technique, we're not sure who's credit to it, but having quarter-sized uh, doll uh, paratroopers coming out of an airplane floating down there would be such a great magic technique to distract and uh, create good diversion. This was very much in line, uh, David explains, very much in line with some gadgets that were also designed at this time by another uh, British uh, intelligence unit called MI9. You may have heard today of units called MI5 and MI6. Those are the main ones in Britain today, but in the wartime, MI9 was uh, dedicated to creating gadgets similar to the ones that David just talked about uh, to help people if they were captured or to carry into battle weapons that would not be apparent or to be used by resistance fighters who weren't supposed to have weapons. So some of them are here. Um, in the upper left, you see a pen that is actually a compass concealed. You see dice. The dice were a part of board games and other games that uh, people would carry around with them during wartime. You can see the dice can contain a message uh, without revealing its contents. Uh, a pen that could turn into a dart pen. Razor blades that were uh, magnetized in a way that would allow them to operate as compasses. And finally, I think the most ingenious thing uh, here, the, the least suspicious, I believe, were pastel paints, a pastel paint kit, which actually contained a number of dyes that could be used to alter the color of a uniform or parts of a uniform in order to change your appearance if you were in a situation where your uniform would be a bad thing to have or your clothing would be uh, a, a giveaway, a reveal of some sort. And David actually has a number of other items along this line that uh, he will show you in 3D to give you a sense for what some of these things uh, looked like and what they did. David? Next time you see a James Bond movie, remember, magicians were first. <laughs> we take credit for all the James Bond stuff. This is a uh, pretty cool, this is a, a wrench. So if you have somebody that's gonna be a uh, kind of a handyman behind the scenes, it's not just a wrench, it's actually a gun. Shouldn't point it at you, but there you go. Um, this is a, it's pretty cool, a flashlight pen. Bang, bang, pretty cool. Nice. A pipe, maybe a firearm. And then this, look at these coin purse. Sorry, if you have a, a nickel here and a little pin, if you need to get documents or messages to somebody and you, well, you have to carry a nickel with you, and if you push there, it will open up and you can conceal information or other items inside that nickel, only openable if you had this little, little pin. But even the purse itself is pretty awesome. If you're in trouble, push the button there and it becomes a firearm, which inside is pretty interesting, so. Thank you, David. I'm gonna take, uh, take you now to what I call a Dudley Clark's masterpiece. I felt with uh, midshipmen in the audience, we needed to do at least one example of ingenuity at sea. And this is uh, a rather macabre one, uh, but, one I think that is famous in the intelligence world. So here's the situation, it's 1943. Uh, the allies have prevailed in North Africa against the Germans, that was Operation Torch. And they are at the front end at the beginning of Operation Husky, which was the operation that planned to invade Southern Europe through Italy. Churchill looks at the map, you see it here, and he says, uh, look, it's obvious to any damn fool, quoting him, that uh, the place we're going to attack is Sicily. Where else would we attack? So I want a deception plan that convinces Hitler we're going to attack somewhere else. Well, it was naval officers who came up with the idea of actually using a corpse 
as a kind of deception device. How do you get a corpse? Well, they went to a morgue and they found a corpse of a vagrant. We think it was a vagrant. And they actually asked permission of the parents. They found the parents. If they could use this corpse, the parents said, yes, provided this corpse, my, our son, gets a Christian burial. They agreed to that. And then they managed to document this corpse, this individual, as Major William Martin with identity cards and what we in the intelligence world call pocket litter, meaning all of the things we carry around that identify us. Uh, a photograph of his supposed fiance, uh, bills from various stores, uh, officer club membership and so forth. And they stuffed his briefcase with documents, including some signed by the highest officials in the British military indicating that uh, he was apparently a courier taking these somewhere in the Mediterranean to senior officers. The documents all indicated that the attack was going to come not in Sicily, but in Greece or in Sardinia or Southern France. They set the corpse ashore from a British, uh, adrift from a British submarine off of Spain, uh, knowing that the tides then would take the corpse up onto the shore of Spain and knowing that the Spanish, then having a fascist government, would transfer these uh, documents and things to the Germans. The Spanish were neutral, but they were close to the Germans. That all happened. The documents made their way back to the German intelligence service. They looked at all of this and they concluded they were genuine. And Hitler actually thinned out his forces on Sicily, making the Allied invasion when it came somewhat easier. It was still tough, but somewhat easier. And he created a whole new headquarters in Greece, uh, even brought uh, General Rommel, the famous General Rommel, back from the Eastern Front to head that uh, false, uh, that new uh, headquarters that he didn't need. <laughs> and uh, basically, as uh, some British officer said, mincemeat was swallowed whole, uh, a deception that worked and that made the Allied uh, attack on Sicily and then later on Southern Europe and Italy. Uh, easier than it otherwise would have been with fewer casualties. So I have no idea whether there was a magician involved in this other than the fact that it under, occurred under the umbrella of uh, Dudley Clark's operation, the nephew of a, of a great magician. And as I look at it, um, I'm sure David would agree, this looks like misdirection, but on a very, very large stage. And let me give you another example of that very quickly a more contemporary one, if we go to 1990 and we look at the uh, Persian Gulf War, Desert Storm, very few people know that the commander of that operation, General Norman Schwarzkopf, was actually an amateur magician and a member of the International Brotherhood of Magicians. Now, again, I don't know whether he this came into play, but again, going back to what David Copperfield said in the very first remark here today, once you've been exposed to magic, it's hard not to think like a magician. And I just suspect that it was in the back of his mind, at least maybe subliminally. He designed an operation that is famous in military history as the left hook. Remember what was going on here. Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait. The United States uh, had uh, vowed that it would push Saddam Hussein and the Iraqis out of Kuwait. And an allied force was assembled to do that. What Schwarzkopf did in the left hook operation was to carry out a, a fake maneuver uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the coast in the Persian Gulf that appeared to be a, 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 an amphibious plan to invade, to put Marines ashore uh, on the coast. This was of course completely false. It drew Iraqi forces over there. And then Schwarzkopf took his forces in this left hook loop around them more or less surrounding them and decimating them in the subsequent battle with uh, very little losses on the American side. Classic economy of force operation, saving our forces, conserving them. Was Schwarzkopf thinking like a magician? I can't prove that. But I look at this and I say, that is a, uh, a deception operation that would come out of the mind of someone thinking like a magician. Now. David has special insight on this next individual, um, John Mulholland, and he's gonna say a few words to you about John Mulholland.
This museum began as John Mulholland's collection, the Mulholland Library of Conjuring Arts. And um, John Mulholland was a, uh, an author, an inventor. Uh, he had the Sphinx magazine for magicians and he was Houdini's friend. And when Houdini passed away, he gave half of his library to the Library of Congress and the other half he gave to John Mulholland. Uh, and when I bought the Mulholland Library, which is about 20% of what you're seeing here, uh, I began this quest uh, of magic history and learning and, and all that. And magic, just so you know, is, is invention, inventions, uh, new technology and techniques. Uh, we invent things with iPhones now. My show is filled with magic that deals with, uh, with digital, digital age. Um, magic that deals with uh, design. Uh, so a lot of invention. Then there is uh, storytelling, which goes back to the Operation Mincemeat uh, story that uh, John was talking about. How do you tell that story to them properly? How do you communicate those ideas in a convincing way? So it's invention, storytelling, uh, and a way of thinking that's interesting. Mulholland designed um, uh, illusions, uh, performed illusions, uh, did a lot of things for magicians, but mostly uh, to this subject, he did something with a little organization called the CIA. And uh, John, you should explain what happened. Yes, Mulholland uh, turns out at, at the height of the Cold War in the mid 1950s was a consultant to the CIA. Now, how did that happen? Well, you have to go back to the Cold War itself. Uh, the American military and the CIA were experimenting with all sorts of things, searching expertise of all kinds for ideas on how to combat uh, the then uh, surging Soviet Union. And they turned to Mulholland as a magician to help them think through some techniques that would be useful in clandestine operations. And Mulholland in 1953 and 54 actually wrote a manual for the CIA, which is now published, and declassified. And it's gotten a lot of attention. There are things in it that aren't very practical, like uh, ideas for how to slip pills and drinks and so forth. And I can tell you in my time at CIA, I came away thinking no one ever used these techniques. But there are things in this manual that are useful uh, to intelligence officers and that I suspect made their way into training for officers who would be operating under surveillance in hostile environments, having to pass messages, uh, having to recruit agents and so forth. So that part of what Mulholland did uh, was probably helpful to the CIA. He had, he brought to the operation of um, of intelligence officers, classic magic concepts like uh, uh, the larger action covers the smaller action. Uh, when you're doing something deceptive, act naturally. He put all of this in the manual. And if you stop and think about it, um, a CIA officer walking down a street in a hostile country under surveillance has to do exactly that. Draw attention away from himself or herself. Um, a larger action somewhere uh, in that vicinity might cover a smaller action that that officer is, is carrying out. This little uh, sketch uh, gives some idea of some of the things that Mulholland uh, put in his book. Um, for example, you see uh, on the left a, a way of uh, surreptitiously gaining possession of a document by placing a book on it, a book that has some sticky wax on it and then adheres to the document or simple things like uh, the pattern of your shoelaces can, can, can convey different messages about when a meeting is taking place, who is present and so forth. And then the classic things of moving an individual in a concealment device, which can be useful when you're trying to smuggle an agent out of a country or try to do an exfiltration for someone who has come under suspicion uh, by a hostile uh, intelligence service. So these are so some of the things that, um, that Mulholland uh, designed and, and put into play in his manual at the CIA. And again, I come back to the fact that this was the height of the Cold War, the mid 1950s. Remember the CIA is a very young organization then. It was created in 1947. So it's only about six years old when Mulholland is doing this. And they were thirsty for ideas and magic was one of the areas they turned to at that time. 
Now I'm going to tell you about an operation in Moscow that is very reflective of that kind of thinking. Now, Mulholland didn't design this, but this kind of thinking, once it gets into a system, becomes very influential. This is a device we called the Jack in the Box, and it was used in the Moscow operations in the 1970s and early 1980s. So what's that all about? Well, in Moscow in those days, and still today, uh, someone suspected of being an intelligence officer, they are surveilled, they are followed. So if you're in a car uh, driving around in a KGB car, an intelligence car from the Soviet Union at that time was following you, you would be able to lose, uh, lose them for about 20 seconds when you rounded a corner at, say, a tall building. They would lose sight of you. In that brief period of time, if there were two people in that car and they could see two heads, one of those people, a case officer we call that person, would roll out of the car, quickly donning a disguise and walking along the street, let's say carrying a lunch pail uh, and looking like a, a Russian worker, while at the same time, the driver of the car would press a button on a seat and up would pop a mannequin head like this with the capability of turning left and right and giving the impression when the KGB car caught up with you and gained sight again of two people still in that car. So nothing had changed. And yet your officer would be walking along the street free of surveillance. That's the key point. And therefore able to make a meeting with a, an agent that was uh, who had been signaled uh, perhaps with one of the techniques that Mulholland had uh, devised to meet you at a certain place. So this was uh, creating the illusion of two people still in the car with a device that uh, I can't prove to you that a magician was involved in creating this, but it is so uh, emblematic of magic that I have to think uh, people were certainly thinking like a magician when they did this. Uh, I'm going to just mention a few things about my personal experience at CIA when I was there and when I, in my private time, was a magician. So uh, this was a very helpful tool to have as an intelligence officer. For example, it enabled me to sensitize officers to the danger of being deceived. Uh, I could, for example, do a, a magic trick for them, but tell them in advance exactly what I was going to do. Let's say tear up a newspaper and then put it back together, telling them in advance, and then asking them if they found that mildly mystifying, and 90% of them would, I could then make the point that if I was able to fool you, telling you in advance what I was doing, think of how much easier it might be if uh, a foreign adversary uh, doesn't tell you what they're doing. And this is something that intelligence officers deal with all the time is that other services, other countries, other intelligence agencies are trying to deceive them. Also magic was a very good icebreaker when I would meet with foreign intelligence services, uh, we would have an occasional meeting, even with ones that were adversaries like the Russians. And uh, nothing broke the ice better than if they knew I was a magician, they would ask to see something and a card trick would just loosen everyone up. Magic, as uh, David Copperfield knows, uh, having done 10 world tours, is a universal language. And so immediately it takes people to a human level. Uh, in other countries, uh, particularly in Asia, I would find that people were very formal and very stiff in formal meetings. But if we went out at night uh, uh, and, and I was able to do a little magic, once again, it loosened everyone up. And the next day, we were just people talking. And occasionally, heads of state would find magic interesting as well. And so magic served me very well as an intelligence officer. The one final point I would make is that Many principles of magic are useful to people operating in clandestine circumstances, and I would use this to train some of our officers. For example, in any magic trick, something can go wrong. We call your response to that an out. Uh, another way to call it would be a plan B. Just as you need a plan B in a military operation, you need a plan B in most magic tricks. And so I would make that point by showing officers a trick and explaining what is the plan B? What is the out that you would use in order to bring this to a successful conclusion, trying to drive home the point that in our operations, we always needed a plan B. So those are just some reminiscences from my time in the CIA and the way that magic was helpful to me. 
Well, I think we're near the end of our program here today. And I just want to say on behalf of myself and David, uh, what a pleasure it's been to be with you and to talk to you about uh, intelligence, war, and magic, and some of the people involved and the operations and how all of this came together at different points in, in history, all the way back to uh, the 19th century. And I think uh, David may have uh, something for you. Say goodbye, I have a little friend here. Watch it and move and move. Goodbye, midshipman. <laughs> It was great. Thanks so much. <laughs>